some of the content, and then I'll do the second half next period. <clears throat> so welcome to lesson five. This is the big lesson for maybe this course, but definitely for this unit where we look at protein synthesis. So we're going to talk about how all the things we've learned in context with everything from lesson one, lesson two, as well as the things we've covered so far in lesson three and the first four lessons with regards to DNA replication. We're going to tie it all in together to look at the big idea that is the central dogma of biology. And this is that fundamental idea that molecules, the genetic molecules that we've looked at in, in the start of this unit are going to give that genetic information and it's gonna have that flow of DNA information from that DNA to the mobile RNA into proteins, which will allow for the general function of cells to be carried out. It's the big idea that connects every single aspect from DNA to protein and enzyme structure and function that really ties in everything we've learned in this class together. So it's important to recognize that DNA comes from the nucleus. We then go through a process called transcription and transcription is the process that allows for information that's coded in DNA or those nucleic acids to be copied into RNA, which will function as a middle of the ground or a mid um, intermediary, sorry, uh, component of the understanding of how DNA gets translated into proteins later. And that is, it's an, just another form of nucleic acid that has those uh, uracils instead of those thymine nucleotides. And that RNA that was transcripted in the nucleus involves the, the transcription or the trans, I don't wanna say translation because it's not quite the same, but it, it involves the transcription and turning that DNA code into an RNA code. And the reason that we do this is because that DNA cannot leave the nucleus. And, and Sarma kind of asked some of those questions earlier today with why isn't DNA the main method with which information is shared and why isn't RNA the only thing that they make? And it, it has to do with that DNA component not being able to leave the nucleus. Uh, and this also is an attempt to try to create a safe haven for that DNA within the nucleus where it cannot get damaged. Because as we look at what happens to RNA later after the translation process, we start to see that that RNA does get in fact broken down. And as a result of that, we wanna keep that DNA safe and that's done via the process of RNA. The next component we wanna look at is the translation component of that RNA and how that RNA now can turn from genetic material or nucleic acids into the concept of protein. So that process which that RNA is then translated into those amino acids that make up a specific protein is, is really the truly the nuts and bolts of this lesson where we look at the idea of how those proteins are made. It involves translation from essentially one language to another, the language of DNA or nucleic acid to the language of amino acids, which can be then formed into proteins. Again, that primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And that is all going to happen within the nucleus because that idea of, of it happening out, sorry, outside of the nucleus, the idea of it happening in the cytosol is to allow for once those proteins are created, they can eventually go in to do the work that they need to do, whether it's in the form of enzyme, create structures, what have you. So in order to properly understand how that works, we need to be able to compare RNA and DNA to each other because both carry genetic information and they both contain a sugar phosphate backbone and utilize the similar uh, three of the same nitrogenous bases. Again, that adenine, cytosine, and guanine. And they're, they're gonna be in pyrimidines, you know, in terms of that one ring component. And that uracil is gonna be complementary to A. It replaces that thymine essentially. So it's still gonna be that pyrimidine. It's still gonna have similar structure, but it changes a little bit. So let's take a look at the difference between RNA and the difference between DNA. So in DNA, we have that deoxyribose sugar. That deoxyribose sugar, meaning there's no hydroxyl group uh, on that second carbon. And the thymine is going to be present instead of uracil. It is double-stranded and will only be in the nucleus. Whereas when we look at RNA, we're looking at a ribose sugar. We're looking at uracil and no thymine. It's gonna be single-stranded, which is very, very, very important 
as we move through the rest of this lesson, the single-stranded nature of RNA will really help us to understand and appreciate how those proteins get made from it. And it really helps us to understand why it's so important that we, trans, uh, we transcribe that DNA to RNA. And then there are also three different types of RNA that exist in various locations. So RNA can kind of be functional in the sense that it can be utilized to fill three different roles within the cell. And those three different roles really are what's separated apart from what DNA can do within uh, the, the functions that it can perform. So those three types of RNA are as follows. We have messenger, messenger RNA, which is mRNA. And this is going to send a message. It's self-explanatory in that name. It sends a message. It's going to send the DNA's instructions from the nucleus to the cytosol. So it's produced by the transcription that happens inside of the nucleus. So it's going to take that genetic information within the nucleus. It's going to be transcribed into RNA, that messenger RNA, and it carries that message out into the cell outside of the nucleus. It again sends that general message of what that genetic information is supposed to do. Transfer RNA is going to be responsible for the translation process. Within the cytosol, it's going to bring amino acids coded for the specific mRNA sequences to be assembled into a, that protein that that messenger RNA is destined to help form. So the transfer RNA or tRNA will help bring the, it will transfer the amino acids that the mRNA codes for to be assembled within that cytosol to create that protein. And lastly, we have what's called ribosomal RNA or RNA. RNA, when in conjunction with the proteins, will form what's called a ribosome. And those ribosomes are the location that translation or protein synthesis occurs. So you can see right now off the bat that those three different types of RNA that we're going to look at today are really, really, really important in the idea that it, they all have to work in conjunction to form that message that the DNA is telling the cell to do to transfer or translate that message, as well as to perform the general act of that translation and that synthesis of that protein as well. So all three of those are very important in the protein synthesis, uh, in the protein synthesis chain, if you will. So now we will look at the stages of transcription, okay? So if you recall, the first stage we're gonna look at is transcription. Transcription is the first thing that needs to happen before we can look at the next steps of protein synthesis. So what is transcription? Transcription is going to be that process of turning DNA into messenger RNA. So what is the first thing that needs to happen? Well, we need to have that initiation. Remember how DNA polymerase was responsible for creating that DNA strand in conjunction with helicase when it was making that copy? Now we have a new enzyme, RNA polymerase, which is going to bind to and unwind DNA at the promoter region. So promoter regions are a sequence found before a specific gene where RNA polymerase will bind and unwind that DNA, thus exposing the genetic code responsible for that specific gene that is about to be turned into the actual cellular component that allows for that expression of that gene. So if you recall back from grade 11 where you learned about genotypes and phenotypes, genotypes being the genetic component, the phenotype being the actual expression of that genetic component, here's where it actually happens in terms of the creation of the protein that allows for that cell to display that trait, i.e. phenotype. It needs to utilize that genetic information from the DNA, i.e. genotype, to completely uh, transcript and translate into that protein structure. So these promoter regions contain something called a TATA box. Uh, it's a sequence of the promoter region with high percentages of A's and T's, or known as TATA box. So these TATA boxes exist right before uh, the promoter sequence starts, which is again right before that gene, which is to be transcribed and translated. These promoter regions contain thymine and adenine, adenine in uh, a large quantity as opposed to the guanine and cy uh, cytosine. And the reason being is that the A and T double bond is significantly easier to open 
than that triple bond of G and C. There's less energy required to put into it. It's easier to uh, break. So every single, every single coding section, every single coding section has a promoter before it. And within that promoter, there is a TATA box or a sequence of A's and T's at the adenines and the thymines, which precede that gene, which allow for that RNA polymerase to attach on and break apart those high concentration of double bonds. Again, because it requires less energy to break the A and T bond than it does for the G and C bond. So you see a TATA box before every single coding gene in any DNA sequence. And it doesn't, isn't just localized or, or specific to humans. I'm talking every single genetic component that utilizes DNA has a TATA box in some way, shape, or form before the coding sequence of that gene. So the initiation stage where RNA polymerase connects and unwinds that DNA at that promoter site allows for the access of that specific gene to be transcribed into that messenger RNA. So the next step of transcription involves a process called elongation. Elongation looks at that RNA polymerase and now that it's bound, it's, bond, it's bonded to that DNA TATA box or that promoter region, it's going to begin to open up that DNA. Once that DNA is open up, it needs to add RNA bases to create that complementary strand. And again, the whole premise of that RNA base is to keep that DNA safe. And if that RNA gets broken down in the cytosol, it's perfectly fine. So the uracil will now complementary bind to the adenine. That complementary strand that's being attached and built by RNA polymerase is a RNA sequence or an RNA strand. And this non-template strand, so the thing that contains the, the complementary strand or the complementary sequences of that gene that's being coded, this non-template strand is also known as the coding strand because it has the exact same base pair sequence as the new mRNA. And this is a very interesting component because you really have to think about, with the exception of the U or the uracil, whatever that RNA strand that's made from the template it will basically be identical to the coding strand with the exception of those uracils for thymine. So the coding strand, if and, and this is a component of RNA polymerase, it will later check to see if that RNA strand is the exact same as that non-template or that coding strand as a means to determine if it is directly quoted that uh, template strand correctly. So as that RNA polymerase moves along the DNA section, it needs that helix to reform behind it until another RNA polymerase binds to that promoter. So it's important to recognize that it's going to be, that RNA polymerase is A, reused, and B, in some way, shape, or form, it's going to help facilitate for that reconnect of that DNA back to the um, original double-strand structure that DNA originally is in. So I asked the question here, why would a cell need multiple copies of the RNA to form right after each other? And this is very important to recognize that you're going to definitely need many messenger RNAs to produce many proteins efficiency, right? You don't just have one mRNA get sent out into the wild because it's really only going to produce one protein. So this RNA polymerase has is, is got many, 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 many um, copies of itself and it will consistently reattach onto that section that's being copied, especially if the cell really needs that specific protein. And it's going to continuously copy that mRNA until it reaches that set value that the cell has determined for it. Um, so it's important to recognize that the, the RNA polymerase, once it finishes with that one specific strand, you're gonna have another RNA polymerase attached directly on and continue making more messenger RNA of that same gene. Because again, usually you need more than just one protein of that specific protein in order for it to function effectively. So transcription ends at stage three with the termination of transcription. That RNA polymerase will stop transcription once it reaches a termination sequence on that DNA template strand. This termination sequence in eukaryotes is a series of adenine bases. And these are transcribed into what's called, again, uracil, which nuclear proteins bind to 
uh, in an attempt to signal the release of that newly made RNA molecule. So once there's a significant tail of uracil that gets transcribed onto this tail end of messenger RNA, nuclear proteins are going to bind to this specific area of high concentration uracil, and it's going to cause that newly made RNA molecule to release. So this RNA polymerase is also released so it can go on to transcribe more genes. So it's interesting to think that these nuclear proteins bind to uracil sequence and then that, uh, that termination occurs because once you have a high concentration of uracil, there's a built-in stop mechanism, for lack of a better word, within the nuclear uh, membrane that binds to that uracil and causes that messenger RNA as well as RNA polymerase to release from the DNA. So this, that's the entire stage of just transcription. And recall, transcription is just the direct transcription of DNA into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA in and of itself is useless until it makes its way out into the cytosol. But before it does that, there needs to be something that's called post-transcription modification. So before that newly made RNA called pre-mRNA is vulnerable. Uh, so because it's vulnerable, to that degradation by enzymes, as well as other factors out in the cytosol, there needs to be some additional modifications to that pre-mRNA before it becomes mRNA and enters that cytosol. And some of those modifications to pre-mRNA are quite ingenious, um, the way that the cell evolved, because again, it, it needs to keep that mRNA alive, for lack of a better term, or, or uh, cohesive, I should say, in the cytosol for long enough for it to function and create that protein. So there are several factors uh, that we're going to look at in terms of modifications. The first modification is the addition of a poly A tail, or tailing as we call it. An enzyme will add a long chain of adenine bases to that three prime end of the pre-mRNA. This will prevent degradation within the cytosol because again, just like telomeres, there are enzymes that are going to um, want to break off and break into that mRNA, uh, break that mRNA into smaller pieces. And so, again, just like telomeres, it adds this long chain of adenine bases. In telomeres, it's a function of, uh, of many different bases. But in this case, a long chain of bases. So that way, when the enzymes first attach on to that tail end, it will cleave off these poly A tails, which are like they're useless other than for preventing that degradation of the actual mRNA of that RNA sequence. So that poly A tail helps to prevent breakdown of the real genetic code that's meant to make it into the cytosol. The, poly, or the 5A cap, or the 5 prime cap, or capping, is a sequence of seven guanine bases that are added to the 5 prime end of the pre-mRNA. And this allows for ribosomes to attach. So not only does it perform a similar function to the poly A tail at the 3 prime end, it allows for those ribosomal complexes, or those R uh, ribosomal RNA, to attach on to that messenger RNA to get that process of translation rolling. And then lastly, we have a process called mRNA splicing. Or, so this is what happens when pre-mRNA is spliced. So sections are removed to form that final mRNA to be translated. This is less for uh, survival within the cytosol and more for the idea that there is going to be some genetic material that was transcribed from the gene that actually may not form anything useful. And, and this is where things start to get a little bit dicey in terms of our understanding of genetics because we're not quite sure why the gene would code some information that isn't necessarily needed and it is in fact removed after the fact from that messenger RNA. Uh, it's a very interesting topic of discussion and debate within the community. Even when I was around your age studying biology and genetics, it was still something that was heavily debated. We have a bit more understanding now, uh, but ultimately it's, it's still up in the air. And so what I mean by that removal or that splicing of genetic information out of that messenger RNA, I'm talking about several components. And the first component I'm going to talk about is something called an intron. This is a sequence that does not contain information needed for a specific protein. So even though, even though it existed in the gene and was transcribed by that RNA polymerase, this information well, on that messenger RNA, it actually doesn't do anything specific for that protein. So it can be spliced out, if you will, because it has no actual function. The exon is a sequence that does 
contain information for a specific protein. So this is the stuff you want to leave within that pre-mRNA or that mRNA once it's finished splicing, because this genetic information that was transcribed from the DNA, this will actually tell the proteins or tell the, um, the ribosomes what to actually code for. And this does contribute to the specific protein structure and ultimately its form. Last component I want to talk about is something called alternative splicing. This depends on the desired protein, but the same mRNA strand can be spliced differently. So again, we're looking at multiple variations within one specific protein that could happen. And this allows for diversity within proteins, right? Because the key thing here that you need to understand is there's only 20,000 potential genes, but it can produce millions upon millions of different proteins. So even though even though that genetic sequence doesn't change, the post alteration or the post splicing of messenger RNA allows for different proteins to be made from one specific gene. So let that sink in for a little bit. The idea here is that we can take one gene that's supposed to be responsible for coding one specific protein. We can actually edit that gene after the fact in messenger RNA and allow for a huge, huge, huge amount of diversity of proteins due to that. Okay, that is the first half of the lesson that I want to uh, talk about. I want you to take a look at section 7.2. I'm going to answer your questions in the chat because there was a couple of questions that were asked that I, I didn't necessarily ignore a purpose, but um, I wanted to address after the fact. So take a look at the uh, section 7.2. Take a look at some of the notes, ask questions, and I can uh, answer those now.